couple weeks ago, I shot a video on the Olympic Peninsula. I wanted it to feel quiet and dreamlike, to paint a picture of this place where time slows down. So I dropped my shutter speed from a 50th of a second to a sixth of a second. If you know your way around your camera settings, they'll help you to get the best possible image out of the camera. If you don't, they could ruin that image entirely. And once you understand them, you can start messing around with them to create some really interesting creative effects. My name's Aiden Robbins, I'm a filmmaker, and today I wanna to share with you the most important camera settings for video, how to use them, and some embarrassing moments when I've used them wrong. We'll get to that, but let's start with aspect ratio, which is really dependent on what format you're making a video for. Are you shooting 16 by nine for YouTube, nine by 16 for TikTok, open gate to get both? Whatever medium you're publishing your video in, make sure to use the appropriate aspect ratio. Another kind of obvious and simple one is resolution and frame rate. Resolution is mostly a compromise between quality and convenience. Higher resolutions mean crispier shots, but they also mean larger files that are harder to work with. Different frame rates, on the other hand, can make footage feel completely different. 24 frames a second is kind of natural, normal feeling. You've also got 30 frames a second, which has a slightly slowed kind of dreamy effect to it all the way down to like 120 frames a second, which is dramatically slow. If you're making a commercial for a product, then slow motion is probably something your client will appreciate. But if you're making a narrative short film, then you probably won't use it much, if at all. Really depends, like most things, on what you're shooting. Now, when you're using different frame rates, it is really important to stay on top of your shutter speed, because this should change alongside your frame rate. Most of the time, it's best to maintain a 180 degree shutter, meaning that your shutter speed is double your frame rate. If you're shooting in 24 frames a second, 1 50th of a second shutter, 60 frames a second, 1 120th of a second shutter, and so on. That'll give you the most natural, normal amount of motion blur. It's important to keep an eye on this if you're switching frame rates. So let's say you're shooting in 24 frames a second with that 1 50th of a second shutter, and then you switch up to 120 frames a second. If you're still at that 1 50th of a second shutter, that's not gonna work with the 120 frames a second. It's gonna completely ruin the footage. So when you switch up to 120 frames a second, make sure you bump up that shutter speed to 1 240th of a second. Or the best option would be to have preset modes in your camera for each frame rate you shoot in. So I have two on mine, one for 24 frames a second and one for 60 frames a second, so that when I switch between them, that shutter speed automatically adjusts and I'm not messing up any shots. All right, we've gotten those basics out of the way. Let's talk about some settings that affect the image that comes out of the camera. The most obvious is picture profile, how the camera processes the image. You have standard profiles where the camera adds enough contrast and saturation to make the footage look normal. You have vivid profiles where it adds extra contrast and saturation for a nice, lively, punchy look. And you also have kind of oddball settings depending on the camera, like black and white and sepia, stuff like that. As a filmmaker, you're probably gonna wanna use a flat profile with minimal contrast and saturation added, or better yet, a log profile, the flattest, least processed version of the image possible. This is gonna keep a ton of detail so that you can tweak those colors in post how you like. A huge one that's easy to overlook is white balance. This isn't a huge deal for photos because you can just shoot raw and change it in post, but for video, it can absolutely ruin a shot if you set it wrong. For example, if you're shooting with shade white balance during a normal daylit scene, then the image is gonna come out overly warm. So then in post, you'll have to pull the colors back and make them cooler, but the image probably isn't gonna look very good after you do that. Also, make sure not to use automatic white balance. Set it manually instead. That way the colors between your shots are more consistent and it'll be a lot easier to get consistent colors in your grade. Another easy to overlook setting that can really break down your image if you're not careful is ISO. Every camera has a native ISO. The ISO at which the image looks the best with the least grain, the most accurate colors, and the widest dynamic range. I think most of us know that as you go above the native ISO, the image gets grainier and muddier, but a lot of people don't realize that it actually goes the other way as well. 
If you're shooting at 100 ISO, but your camera has a native ISO of 640, then you're probably still gonna get a muddy, grainy image with inaccurate colors and poor dynamic range. So make sure you're always at that native ISO. And finally, bit rate and bit depth. These determine the quality of image that the camera outputs. So a higher bit rate and bit depth will mean a larger file size, but also a more robust image that you can push further in the grade. When you select a resolution and frame rate, the bit rate or bit depth will be listed, but it's kind of fine print and it can be easy to accidentally set the wrong one. You wanna know how I found that out? Well, a couple years ago, I shot a video for Camelback and I got to the edit to realize that I had accidentally shot almost everything in 8-bit instead of 10-bit. Before the shoot, I had switched my camera to 30 frames a second, but didn't realize that I had accidentally switched it to the 8-bit version of 30 frames a second rather than the 10-bit version. I was able to make the footage work in the grade and the video turned out fine, but it was a lot harder than it would have been had I just checked more closely and made sure I was shooting in 10-bit. So check that bit rate when you change your camera's resolution and frame rate. If your camera has the option to shoot 10-bit, most of them now do, make sure you're taking advantage of that. And if it even has 12-bit, go ahead and use that one for an even higher quality image. All right, let's move on and talk about some display tools. And these won't appear on the final image, but they're displayed while you're shooting to help you set up shots. These can be grid lines and the level for setting up your composition, and also the histogram, which shows you the value throughout your image so you can make sure you're exposing properly. Turning on zebras can warn you when the highlights are getting too bright and are about to lose detail. And you can also turn on focus peaking, which indicates which parts of the shot are in focus. Your camera might even have false color, which shows you kind of a map of the exposure throughout the image. And finally, let's talk about a couple of tools that can be really helpful for shooting video if you set them up correctly. The first of which is autofocus. When you're using autofocus for video, it's important to enable continuous autofocus so the camera keeps adjusting the focus while you're recording and also to enable tracking autofocus so the camera will lock onto a single subject and keep that in focus rather than jumping the focus around throughout the shot. In-body image stabilization or IBIS can also be incredibly helpful for shooting smooth footage but if you leave it on when it's better turned off, it can ruin a shot. For example, if you're shooting on a really wide angle lens, you should probably turn that stabilization off most of the time so that you don't get a weird wobble around the edges of the frame. That's all I have for you in this one. Thank you so much for watching it. I hope you enjoyed this one, learned something new from it. And if you did, be sure to subscribe to Adorama TV for thousands of other videos just like this one. And if you're curious about some of my work, you can go follow me as well, but don't tell anyone you heard that from me. Thank you so much again for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.